All right, so in this video, I wanna go over some of the tools and resources I use to plan my trips, five or six pointers on the tools I use, and then I'm gonna go over a little bit of how some of that planning compared to what actually happened in the field. So I'll jump right into it. My first and favorite tool, which I use all the time, is Gaia GPS. So Gaia GPS is an online tool, has both a web page and an app. I use it to plan my trips. I'm on this website all the time. I have the paid version, I think it's well worth it. I use the phone app when I'm on my trips. You have a system with pull layers that you can add. The most common layers that I'm using besides the base map are different satellite views, slope angles, a big one, and then this kind of strange outdoors map, which I'll just explain something about that after. But these, these are all tools that I use in combination. So, you know, what I'm looking for typically is Beyond the, the normal trails that are really well known, I'm trying to link up or kind of create interesting routes of my own, um, routes that are done kind of outside the normal season. I'll be talking quite a bit when in the context of winter trips, which are just kind of different beasts from three season hiking. And I just sort of scroll around. I'm looking for interesting kind of weaknesses, ways through mountains. I'm not typically doing peaks and stuff like that, but I also don't want to just stick to valleys. So. I'm looking for an interesting mix where I can get through, you know, a, a route through a valley that might involve a pass somewhere or multiple passes just to keep it interesting and get from one place to the other. I'll give you guys an example. Right now I'm looking to try and scope out a route um, from Banff to Lake Louise, which I think would be a really fun and interesting trip. I really like those trips where you get from A to B. Um, it just keeps you motivated and there's a certain amount of commitment. Once you get halfway through it, really no point in turning back. You gotta go all the way to the end. So that's the kind of thing I'm looking for. What is so great about Gaia is that you have all of this different information right at your fingertips. So I really like using, uh, again, the base map, but then slope angle is a big one. So the slope angle feature highlights anything above 25 degrees so I believe if you click on the slope angle it gives you a, a menu so anything above 25 degrees or 26 degrees is shaded in, in yellow and then the darker you get the steeper the angle I obviously have a sort of a very Canadian optic on this so I'm using tools that are available in Canada but you have all kinds of other map layers based on where you are um, especially in, in the United States. I, I can't speak to it for elsewhere in the world, but I'm guessing there's tools for all over the world. And then another pretty interesting tool is the FreshSat, which is a satellite view that's as recent as possible. So it's not as high quality as your standard satellite views that are on databases, but they're very recent. So for example, if I look at the FreshSat Cloud Free for this area, you see that the image is from December 22nd, 2022, which is just a few weeks ago. It's the winter, everything is very white. That was selected for being a cloud-free image, the most recent cloud-free image. If you go to the recent, it's basically the most recent image. And you see here there's cloud cover. It was taken today. So this is just really interesting stuff, but you start to get an idea of what's going on. For shoulder season trips, when you can start to get an idea, is there snow cover? Um, is there any lingering snow on certain routes and things like that? And then the other one that I find interesting is this outdoors map. What I've found about this one is that sometimes there's things on this map that aren't elsewhere. I'll give you guys an example of that. I've This is an area near uh, Cinnaboyne Mountain and there's these little very thin approach routes that you can actually map out and they're not on any other map so these sort of long lost or sort of almost secret routes. You can use these to sort of plan at the macro scale you can also use this um, Gaia to plan at kind of the micro scale where you literally map out your hikes and save them in, in a format that can open up on your phone and you can also export them to other systems like I'll export them to my Garmin devices and things like that um, and it's just it's so simple it's it's really just a question of uh, clicking and if there's a trail that's there it kind of snaps to it in a pretty smart way if there's no trail you know you can just do it in a straight line obviously have to 
kind of click more to get some granularity in there. You can save your files and you get distances, elevation, things like that. It's just a really powerful tool. There's two kind of negatives I find to Gaia. One is the printing function. The printing function is the printing and saving function doesn't save in a real sort of map format, which I wish it did. And then you could print them out to have as a hard copy on your trips. The other disadvantage is that you really have no idea in terms of trails, how often they're used. So I can give you another example of that. I did a trip last, um, last year and I went up, I was going to go up to this Lillian Lake campground, but it, it was really busy. So I went up this lost lake route and you know, here it looks like a trail on the map, but when you get there, it's really just a route. So I've learned sort of the hard way that anything that's called a route on Gaia is hardly ever used or often is hardly ever used. So I have to, I take that into consideration when I'm planning things that a route can be a pretty faint old trail that gets hardly any use and can really slow you down. So it looks like, you know, on this, it looks on this map, like the trail to Lillian Lake would be the same as the trail that goes up to lost to the lost lake route, but they're not. This is literally a highway and this is nothing. So you have to be kind of careful about how you use Gaia, just in case it looks like there's a trail there, but there isn't really. Another tool that I really use quite a bit is Google Earth. And Google Earth has some advantages. Obviously it's, it's a mapping tool, just like Gaia, but what I use, um, what I use Google Earth for is the fact that it gives you a slightly different perspective. So you see when you're far out, you have an, an overhead view, but when you zoom in, you can get an angled view. And that gives you a really neat view on things in terms of what's actually happening at certain places. So you can change that angle to be more shallow. And if you zoom in, and then you can also change which way you're looking. So this is a pass that I came over last year. So this can really give you a lot of insight into somewhere that you're going. And I'll give you guys another example, which is, um, a route that I'm looking at again for this uh, Banff to uh, Lake Louise possible route. There's this pass here that is just concerning me a little bit. If I go into Gaia and I look at the route that I'm planning, Pulsatia Pass, and if you look at it, there's some steep slopes around there. We'll go in and add the slope angle, and you see that. The route isn't on the steep slope angles, so that's fine, but it doesn't mean that this place isn't dangerous. You're basically running the gauntlet here of potential avalanche terrain. To get a little bit more information about that, you can go into Google Earth, and this is that same pass, and what I'm going to do is zoom in, change my angle a little bit. And you know, it's not too bad. This leads to another kind of, um, you know, there's definitely some steep slopes, but they're not too bad. I feel like if you went down the middle of this, you might be pretty safe. Once you get to this area here, you might get kind of dodgy here. It's pretty concerning. There's, it looks like there's some thin trees here, probably some avalanche danger. Well, there's definitely avalanche danger throughout the whole pass. I wouldn't want to hang out and have lunch there. I would move through there really quickly. So I just find with Google Earth, you just get this really interesting perspective view that allows you to see things from a different angle and uh, sort of poke around and scope things out virtually. Say maybe I would want to go up this pass on this corner then skirt through the middle and then get the hell out of there as fast as possible. <laughs> There's no other way to say it. I wouldn't want to hang around there in the winter. Another major tool that's available to people are guidebooks. Right now, my favorite guidebook is this one here, Ski Trails in the Canadian Rockies by Chick Scott. Now, obviously, if you're somewhere else in the world, this doesn't apply to you. 
but the general concept does. So what this guidebook does is give you first-hand information on what an area is like. Now you have two ways of using it. I can use it as is, as the tool, and say I'm going to follow the routes that he does. If you don't know who Chick, Chick Scott is, he's one of Canada's most uh, accomplished mountaineers. I think Canada's first mountaineer to do an 8,000 meter peak. First person to ski from Banff to Jasper. Just amazing accomplishments. And he does just all kinds of, he, he used to do all kinds of weird stuff. So this book is about backcountry Nordic skiing. Now, what that gives me is this first-hand experience of linking what's on the map to what it's really like out there. And the way I've been using that this as a tool is to do the trails that he describes, take into account what the map looks like, so what the information is that I have from satellite imagery, from everything that's on Gaia, to what he describes in the book, how it turns out when I go there. I can kind of use that as a learning tool for my own trip saying, well, if that's what it looked like on the map, that's what he described, and this is how it turned out to be, well, that can carry forward onto other places that aren't described in a book. So I really use it as a tool, a, a learning tool to get more information about what I could potentially do. Another really important resource that I don't think people do or kind of use enough is just going out and doing kind of like recce or poking around and doing day trips. So that's something that I did last year on the Skokie Loop. So I, the Skokie Loop is the trip that I just posted a video about the other day that I did with Justin. So last year I went out and skied up and over Deception Pass. So the way that we did the route, and, and I'll get to kind of how we, we, we came to these decisions later, but the, the, the sort of standard way of doing the loop is uh, counterclockwise around the back of Fossil Mountain. And I think in the summer, people cut over in between Fossil Mountain and come back, and, that, and that's the loop. I could be wrong about that. No idea. I, I really didn't look into the Skokie Loop that much more than my map, and then the information that's described in this book for, for skiing on, on different parts of the loop. So last year, I was new here, and I didn't know what the winter was like, what the conditions were like, what how to interpret everything. So I just went and poked around for a day. So I skied out to Deception Pass. I went up here, that, I got there around noon. I went down the backside and sort of poked and looked around a bit in here in front of, um, this is the wall of Jericho. So I went and I think I went down into a sort of a gully down here. Then I realized it was not a fun place to be. So I turned around and skied out. So I knew from poking around that this section here the 10 or so kilometers to deception pass you could definitely do in a day and you can and i did there and back in a day so it was a 20 kilometer day there was no issue there so when it came to to doing this route this year justin and i spoke about it and um you know we were pretty confident that first of all day one we would go to this campsite to a campsite that's right here See if I can get the layer. Yeah, Baker Lake Campground. So there's a designated campsite there. Now in the winter, the de de designated campsites are kind of a little bit meaningless, but you do have to reserve things and, and, and get permits. So you put down campsites. They're obviously not as strict in the winter. There's no one that's gonna come around and check you at five o'clock. There's gonna be no warden there that's gonna come and say, hey, are you really supposed to be here? But we plan to get here. And this was definitely doable in a day because I knew that it, could, it would only take a few hours to get to Deception Pass. So from there, just a few kilometers further, even though there's probably gonna be no route there, uh, wouldn't be a problem. And then I also knew that for our last day, first of all, Skokie Lodge is, is, a, is a really famous lodge here. People stay there, there's gonna be people there and that's part of the route out. So I knew that on our last day, we were planning to camp at Merlin Meadows that that would probably be a pretty straightforward day. And it just left us with the question mark of day two, which was going from Baker Lake around to Merlin Meadows. And that was really our, our spot of concern, that this A, um, when we got there, there was 
no tracks, so we knew that no one had been there. And that's what was that's what's described in Chick Scott's book. He describes the loop going around, Skok leaving from Skokie Lodge around Fossil Mountain and back through the uh, the valley or the, the the sort of gully between the two mountains. And uh, he says that you're probably going to have to do some route finding down in the valley here because there's really not much of a trail in the winter. And that ended up being true. So there was no no ski tracks. There was nothing. We had to find our way, but it really confirmed everything that we were um, expecting. And we did end up meeting up with tracks right around here where um, it seems that people regularly do a loop around Skokie Mountain. And that's where if you look in our trip videos, you know, it just, the trip completely changes the moment we get here because it's kind of smooth sailing from there on in. But, you know, when I, when I was thinking about this trip, everything kind of came into consideration. First of all, if you look at, if you add layers, so the slope angle, and look at what's going on there. Let's see if the slope angle pops up. Okay, slope angle. So I had been there the year before, and it even says in guidebooks that there's really not much of an avalanche risk along this whole route here. But when I kept on looking at it, you know, around here also, I'm, I was a little bit actually worried about this area. It looked like both of this area on, near the lake and behind this mountain could be kind of at risk of avalanches. And going in between Skokie and Fossil Mountain could be a risky place. And it, it even says that, um, that in Chick Scott's book that you don't really want to hang out in this area here because there's some avalanche runout zones. Now it's not steep areas here, but if you change that to satellite, you'll see that clearly if something avalanches up here, it's going to run out all the way down to the base and from here also. Got a massive amount of snow that could pile up on here. It's all steep. If that avalanches, it's coming right here. and You can see that that's what happens all the time. It probably slides every year, maybe multiple times a year. And then also in this area too, you can see that it slides there, but um, this is very, very steep and it seems more like slough avalanches, which, uh, which are a little bit, were less of a concern. We did see some evidence of recent slough avalanches all on these walls, but small slough avalanches aren't really a big concern. They just slough off loose snow. What we're always, what everyone's really concerned with is our slab avalanche. This route just was, I don't think it gets done very often in the winter, but I think it's an amazing route and everything, all of those tools. So using Gaia, using the guidebook, using some poking around, some, some sort of preliminary trips, and then also talking back and forth with Justin, who also has a lot of experience around here. Um, you know, we kind of arrived at the same conclusions in terms of how far we could travel in a day, what the route would look like, if we were comfortable with the avalanche risk and all of that stuff. Some other tools that are a little bit more useful as you get closer to your actual trip. One of them is SpotWX. I think SpotWX is something that I just started using uh, this year actually. I had no idea. Actually, I started using it this this past summer. So SpotWX is a weather forecasting tool and what it allows you to do is to just sort of pick anywhere on the map. I could say, uh, let's see something. Let's look at, well, where we were on the Skokie Loop two weeks ago. So you just click somewhere on the map and then you get these different modeling tool, you get different weather forecasts, a short term all the way to long term, 16 days out. So the this is, these are the Canadian models and then the American, I'm not sure how different they are and if this is better or worse quality for American um, areas, but this is, a fantastic tool. So if you haven't heard about SpotWX, I highly recommend it. So once you click on one of those forecasts, you get a lot of information. So the, the temperature throughout the day modeled for that area and elevation, uh, dew point, and these are things that you can add or remove. So here it looks like the feels like temperature is very similar to the model temperature. Another interesting tool is the 700 millibar. So this is the temperature at around 3,000 meters, so quite a bit higher than, um, so this one, the, the model is for 22,000, uh, 2,200 meters, and the 700 millibar is for about 300 or uh, 3,000 meters or about 10,000 feet. So sometimes you'll see things like temperature inversions, things like that. 
interesting for avalanche forecasting and things like that if you're going, if you plan to go up higher on the mountain. Precipitation, cloud cover, wind, pressure, just really useful information and really, I found it to be really quite accurate well, as good as you can get for a weather forecast. And obviously, as you go out to more things more like the 16 day forecast, they, they start to add in uh, potential rain, you can kind of see trends. You know, here, the modeling is very tight. And as you go out to 10 days and 16 days, there, it starts to be more, well, what's within normal for that time of year. But if there's a significant drop, well, that's telling you something. So like, if I was planning to do a trip in two weeks, and it was telling me that you know, they're expecting minus 30, I might start to change my plans a little bit. Another tool is Avalanche Canada. So where we are, avalanches are a real problem, but this tool is not only useful for avalanches, it's just useful to know things about the snow. So this is the forecast for Banff. It'll tell you that, you know, things aren't great right now. And that's been the sort of the story of the year. There's a really weak layer from mid-November and another one from mid-December, which is causing a risk of slab avalanche. This is something that you want to be looking at. And in terms of, that's in terms of the avalanche forecast, but it's also for just the snowpack. So if you go into the details, it'll tell you stuff about the snowpack, just the overall snowpack, how deep it is, things like that. And it'll tell you, it, it gives you just a lot of information on what the conditions are like in the field. They update this daily. So you get a lot of information brought in from experts and then also from people. So there's these things called MIN reports, which is the Mountain Information Network, where individuals can post their experience. You know, the story is pretty consistent for this year that the snow is kind of crappy. Now, if I go back to kind of a, just a general story about how I use, about how I use the tools, one of the, a, a good example is my traverse of the ghost last year. So I have a trip report on that. I have a video on YouTube on that. And basically I had seen this really interesting line that cut across the front range of the Rocky. So Banff is over here, Canmore's over here, the front range mountains, the front range of the Rockies is, is here going north-south. And there's this whole wild area called the Ghost Public Land Use Zone. And, and I had been poking around in here early in the season, so early May, and it just looked like there was an interesting possible route to cut across the whole range. So I had some information from uh, some guidebooks about this ghost, this Carrot Peak route that goes up the ghost, the South Ghost River. And then just from the maps and looking around at it, I planned out this route that crosses the entire range from Carrot Peak. And the original plan was to go up to Stenton Lake and go through this this pass here and down and out through um, through the access route to that scramble and then out via Carrot Creek. The start of this route is up a dry creek bed, which I only found out was dry when I got there. And then you get into the real mountains about 20K in, 20-25K in right around here. You start to gain some elevation, get into the Alpine. And my plan was to cut across from this slope on, on Carrot Peak to Stenton Lake and, and out via the pass here. When I got up onto these slopes here, I could see across and this whole area looked like, it looked terrible. So there were some massive cornices from here across this ridge. I just didn't want to be up in that area. And I had seen from the map that there was a potential way out down via this pass here and out to rejoin my original route. And that's that's sort of what ended up happening. So again, it, it was a route that I planned using Gaia, all the maps on Gaia, mapping on Google Earth, information from some guidebooks. And the guidebook does describe some, the guidebook briefly mentions a possible backpacking trip using the Carrot Peak route 
and then cutting out through Carrot, the Carrot Creek drainage, but says it's a challenging backpacking route. And it's really, they leave it at that. So I haven't seen much information about it anywhere else. Early season with snow, definitely more advanced. So those are some of the tools I use. I hope some of this was uh, useful and that you get some value out of it, helps you plan some routes. You can also check out this video, which is the trip report for my crossing of the ghost.